Thank you, Dixie. That was great. We're going to start by opening up with a song, Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine, all glory divine, in His salvation, which is our God, for in His Spirit, what should be this morning. This weekend, we're celebrating freedom. There's more freedoms than just our country. I'd like to read in Colossians 2, 6 and 7. And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down deep into him and in your, and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught, and you will overflow with thankfulness. That's freedom. Let's bow our heads. Loving Father, as we begin this service, we just give ourselves to you. Thank you that you've promised to be with us. Thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. 
And now we have several announcements. Today we're having communion for the first time in person for about 18 months. December 28 of 2019 was the last time we had communion. So this is wonderful. Uh, we have had a couple of digital communions, but it's good to have all of you here in person and everybody who is online, welcome to you also. Our offering today is for our local church budget. And if you've looked at the back of our offering or our um, bulletin, you've seen that God has blessed us in a mighty way and thank you to everyone. But we must continue because there's still things our church needs and we're still growing and a growing church cares about others. There's a primary division outdoor vespers July 16. I don't see anybody here, but it's a social event for the primary Sabbath school kids and families. If you're part of the primary Sabbath school, please prepare and plan for our campfire supper. You can call Michelle Enig if you need further information. There's uh, village day camps are available this summer. And please be aware of that for your children. If you're looking for that, there's more options for VBS. Uh, the Good Neighbor and Walla Walla City Adventist Churches will run a VBS from 6 to 8 p.m. on July 11 through 16. And then for our own VBS, we want to remember that. Please remember to register online. I'm planning on helping, and I went online and registered. It's not that hard. So we need more helpers. Any of you who would be available that time, that is August 2 through 6 from 9 to 12 in the morning. Uh, there's announcements here. It says if you function in the digital age and Twitter and Tweet and Instagram or Facebook, remember to check out these digital locations. Our website and our Facebook are our primary communication hubs. And I don't think this one's up there as one of our slides, but Next week, if it doesn't get too hot, plan, if you'd like to go on a bird walk, plan to come 5.30 here at the church. We'll meet and carpool and go out and see what birds are still out and about next Sabbath afternoon. Rachel, you have an announcement. Good morning. Um, I just have a quick announcement for the women in our church. Um, you can pick these up at the back table in the foyer, uh, but we're having a women's ministry event um, the 18th of July at 4.45 p.m. And um, it's, our theme is Laced with Grace, and we would love for each and every woman of you to come and to really have a nice meal together, some fellowship and a really nice program um, that's going to be put on. And a Bible verse that just kind of goes along with our theme of grace um, is 2 Corinthians 12, 9. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Thank you, and I hope you all can attend. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And there's more announcements or things in the bulletin. Be sure to check that out. Are you doing the kids' story? Cool.
<laughs> I'm just following along. I mean, hey, you know. So, yes, I'll, I'll be telling the children's story today, apparently. So, we like your story. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, I'm so used to lecturing in a mask that I just do it without even thinking about it. So hopefully you'll, you'll humor me. Um, the story I want to tell today actually happened about 40 plus years ago. So I had to call the experts this morning, my parents, to ask them about it. Because it's a story that happened when I was a small child um, in Africa. And last week, Pastor Eric preached a sermon, uh, for those of you that were here and or saw it. And remember, it had to do with Paul and the snake, uh, where he was... Um, throwing some wood in the fire, and a snake um, bit him on the hand. So my story has to do with a snake, and I've been enjoying the story about the skunk for the last couple of months on that one. That was, that was pretty legendary. Um, but this story happened uh, when I was pretty small, and we were missionaries in Nigeria. Now, my parents are from Australia originally. Uh, my mom was born in Fiji, um, a mission kid, obviously. And they don't like snakes because there's a lot of snakes in Fiji and Papua New Guinea. I see a Papua New Guinea flag over here. Uh, my mom was a missionary there um, in Solomon Islands as well. And she lived in northern Australia where there's a lot of snakes. So my parents do not like snakes. Okay, In Australia, there's like the nine most poisonous things in the world and like six of them are snakes or something like that. So, so they don't like snakes, and that kind of transferred to me as well. Somehow it didn't make it to the next generation, because my kids think snakes are cool. Um, they're twisted, but, you know, there might be other reasons for that. <laughs> Love you guys. So um, my parents had been um, missionaries for a little while in Nigeria, and my dad was a teacher, and he was working at what's now called Babcock University, and um, there were some people that were there from other countries. There weren't just Nigerian people who came to the school there. And uh, the, there were some people from, like, Ghana and other countries, Sierra Leone and whatnot. And so, like, you know, any college kid anywhere that's far from home, food on Sabbath is often best if it's at someone's house, not yours. And so they had invited some people over. And, um, you know, I was little, and in those days, um, probably is still true to some extent, um, you, you know, the, the saying, you can play with your food after you've eaten your toys, probably applied to me. And um, also, it's been referred to by John Bradshaw as when the kid eats, you get what's called the mark of the feast, you know, all over their face. So, apparently, I had a messy face, or at least that's the part of the story that I'm sticking with since my parents can't remember. And they went in, my dad went into the bathroom to get a washcloth to wipe my face off, get rid of the mark of the feast, you know. And um, he, he goes in there and he notices a snake coming out of the toilet. It was black, so we're going to assume that it was a black mamba, although it might not have been, but we'll make that assumption. And black mambas are actually kind of a green color and their mouth's black, but anyways... So, but in the dark, you don't really know what color it is. So my dad, of course, was like, oh, there's a snake in the bathroom. And he tells these kids that are there for, you know, for lunch. And this one gentleman goes, well, you know, we know how to get it out. And so they gave my dad a few ideas. And one of them involves putting a stick down the toilet, you know, just kind of moving it around. Well, that didn't work. The next one involved putting some chemicals down the toilet. And my dad at that time was a chemistry professor, but he tells me he did not go up to the university to raid their chemical supply closet. So they probably put something down equivalent to Drano or something like that. Didn't work. So they still got this snake in there. And the guy goes, well, how about you put down boiling water? Yeah. Mr. Snake didn't like the boiling water. And so Mr. Snake went down, and apparently there was an air vent in that toilet, and it came, and it was trying to get out the air vent that goes, like, up to the top of the roof and out. He was trying to get out that, and he couldn't, because he couldn't get traction with his scales on the slippery pole, the tubing. And so um, the gentleman, uh, one of the gentlemen, his name was um, Kumba. He was from Sierra Leone, my parents remember. And he um, had an, an eye disorder that made my parents wonder if he could see properly. But he said, I'll, I'll take care of this. And my parents are like, okay, buddy. So he goes out the back, and he does whatever he does. And the snake is soon killed. And like conquering males everywhere, he puts it on a stick and holds it out for photographs. 
And so my parents have a photograph of this very proud African man holding a snake that he killed on a stick. Then my parents got to thinking that the toilet hadn't flushed very well all week long. And that got them rather scared, considering what could have happened while you were um, <clears throat> taking care of business. So what's the point of the story? The point of the story is this. Number one, snakes are bad. <laughs> Number two, always trust the experts, even if they have eye disorders. <laughs> because they know what they're talking about. That, that guy knew exactly what to do, and he managed to kill the snake. And number three, God always takes care of us. And finally, the one that I think is most important is whenever there's a problem, a community knows how to solve it best. Thanks for listening. That was great. How many of you enjoyed the story? All right. Let's sing the song, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus.
we stand for our opening song, Just a Closer Walk. closer drawn to Jesus. I'm wondering, do we have people who have prayer requests that you'd like to raise your hand? There's several. How about praises that we have? Yes, one thing is that even though it's been so hot, we've gotten through this week, God has been our help and strength. That's good. There's other things. Let's bow our heads. Loving Father, thank you that we can come to you. Thank you that we've been able to come to this place this morning to praise you, to glorify you, because 
you're worthy. Thank you for salvation that Jesus brings to us. Thank you for the freedom that that brings. Thank you for the country in which we live. I ask that you be with our leaders, guide them. Thank you for protection during the heat. You're good. You give us help or inspiration. Thank you. Most of all, we thank you for forgiving us for the things we've done that weren't right, that haven't been like you. Cleanse us and make us whole. Thank you for the freedom in Jesus that we have. I ask that you be with those people, the requests that have been made. You know the people's needs. You know the different things that are plaguing them or others. Take care of it in your way. And thank you for all the praises that we have. Oh, Father, you're good. You care for us. You love us. And now I ask that you be with us during this communion service. Be with Eric as he brings us a message. Guide us. Draw us closer to you. That's what you want, and we want it. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I ask it all. Amen. Before we proceed with our time of remembrance in the communion service, I want to spend a few minutes in the Word. Specifically this morning, I want to look at two stories in the book of John. One is found in John chapter 4. The other is found in John chapter 6. In John 4, we find a woman. She was thirsty. The heat of the day had peaked and she needed to head out to get water. But water wasn't the only thing she was thinking about. It's possible. It's possible she was carrying other burdens as well. It's possible she was a survivor of neglect and abuse and abandonment. This broken experience had started young and was yet to end. It's possible she had tried to fill the brokenness and emptiness with new relationships, each one giving distraction and stimulation for a time, but ultimately, ultimately falling short of what she was looking for. But today... Today, she chose to focus on her thirst. She was thirsty. Her kids were thirsty. She knew she needed to get water, so slipping on her sandals and wrapping her robes around her, guarding against the glaring midday sun, she slipped out of the city gate with jar expertly balanced on her head and a goatskin bag wrapped in a cord under her arm. She descended the hill from Sychar. Jacob's well came into view and her her heart sank. 
She had come at noon to be alone. But there, sitting on the worn stones, sat a man. But he was a Jewish man. At least he wouldn't talk to her. Those men were so full of themselves, they couldn't be bothered to notice a Samaritan woman. Quietly, without making eye contact, she approaches the well, unwraps the cord from around the goatskin bag, and begins to lower it into the well. Give me a drink. Shocked, the woman pauses. Who does this man think he is? Disbelief floods her mind, and she is now forced to interact with someone when she's already carrying so many things. All men do is want something from you, she thinks. Her mind, her mind quickly forms a response. How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? The man responds, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get this water? You see, there was no rope sitting there with a goatskin bag or with a bucket. Everybody had to bring their own. In fact, traveling bands would take their own goatskin bag with the rope with them from place to place so that they could retrieve their own water from the random wells they crossed. Jesus' disciples probably had one with them, but when they left him at the well, they took the bag with them. Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well with his sons and his flocks and drank from it? Little does she know. Jesus says to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Story two. Two chapters later in the book of John and John chapter 6, Jesus and his disciples have traveled around the the edge of Galilee and, and they find themselves on a small rise and there gathered around them are 5,000 men plus their families. And, and Jesus is sitting here talking to these people from, from the beginning of the day until the late afternoon. And he realizes, he knew this ahead of time, but he realizes very soon that they will need to go home, but there's nothing for them to eat. If they brought lunches, they've already been eaten, and the journey is miles to go. Andrew, who seems to be aware of who needs to meet Jesus, finds a small boy and brings a small boy with just a small lunch bag to Jesus and says, I don't know what you can do with this, but here's something. You know the story. Jesus tells the, the, the group to sit down in, in, in groups of 50 to 100, and, and then he starts, he prays, and then he starts bringing food out of the container. One fish, two loaves of bread, two more fish. Everybody's counting. When he gets to 10 fish and 15 loaves, they realize something odd is going on. The disciples spread out among the crowd, and I'm guessing it was more than just the 12. You realize Jesus had more disciples than only 12. They they spread out amongst the crowd, taking the food to the people, and within an hour's time, with good organization, everyone had enough to eat with food to spare. They were miraculously fed. 
But then the minds of the people begin to turn and they start thinking, if he can do this, what else could he do? They begin to chant, he should be our king. Blessed is the son of David. He needs to take David's throne. You see, these people were desperate. And they thought they could satisfy their need, placate their desperation through setting him on David's throne on which the imposter Herod was sitting. He could lead them to war. Jesus could feed them. They'd never go hungry. And if they were wounded or killed in battle against the Romans, Jesus could take care of that too. He was the solution to their pent-up frustration that they had been carrying for generations. Ever since the Assyrians invaded, the Babylonians destroyed the capital, the Greeks corrupted the temple, and the Romans established their crushing empire, God's people longed for freedom. Autonomy. They corporately yearned for the ancient days of David and Solomon when Israel was something. When Israel was a growing power, had military might, and no one dared challenge them. They longed for those days. And Jesus? Jesus seems to satisfy that need. Quickly realizing what's happening, Jesus sends the disciples down to the boat and says, go ahead of me across the lake. And then we don't know how, he calms the crowd and sends them away. I'm reminded of the time in Nazareth where when the crowd wanted to kill him, he just walks calmly through the crowd and they can't do a thing to touch him. I mean, there are things that Jesus could do that are beyond you and me in our, in our humanness. Somehow he calms the crowd and dismisses them. This deep-seated frustration that rose in the, in the crowd seems to have interrupted a teaching that Jesus wanted to connect with the feeding of the 5,000. Because if you continue the story in John chapter 6, if you continue the story, Jesus comes back around to what he wanted to teach this crowd and teach his disciples. And let me point it out. In John chapter 6, verse 35, this is what Jesus wanted to bring back around. This is what he wanted to connect with this, with this miracle. John chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. You know, we, we always chase those things right in front of us. Our hungers, our thirsts, those things that we think we need or that we actually need. Jesus talks about that in Matthew 6. He points out that in Matthew 6 that the Father knows we need food, we need drink, we need clothing, we need security. But he says, keep your eyes on what's most important. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. The Samaritan woman came to get water, the crowd came to get food, and Jesus offered more. Spiritual food that satisfies more deeply and richly than any physical thing can ever satisfy. What did he offer? He offered himself. And he still does so today. Today, he offers himself. He calls us to internalize his presence, nourishing our souls and transforming our hearts and our minds. As Jesus ended his ministry, as his sacrifice drew near, he gave us physical symbols to remember the internalization of Christ, the bread of life and the living water. And today... We're internalizing those symbols. In a moment, we're going to pause this service, and, and those of us who are here in person are going to 
we're going to go do this foot washing thing is a symbol of serving each other and loving each other and putting each other first. And you're welcome to join in that if you're comfortable. If you're not comfortable doing that, you're welcome just to sit here. We're going to have some quiet music going. You can just sit here and reflect for a little bit. But I want you to know, to, to participate in the communion service, you don't have to be a member here. If you want to follow Jesus, you can be a part of this. You don't have to do this, but you're welcome to. It's simply a reminder that we as followers of Jesus are to serve each other and invite him into our lives. We're continuing to stream the service. There's going to be a, a blank spot in our service here where you won't hear anything. You'll probably just see a blank screen of some sort, a nice logo. But we'll kick that video back going once we regather here after the foot washing. And as well, after we uh, do the foot washing, in the lobby as you walk back in, there'll be little prepackaged communion emblems. You're welcome to pick one of those up, bring it in here with you, and then we'll continue our service of communion. We also will have some extras. So if we run out of there, we've got a few extras that we can, we can hand out once we're back in here, if that's needed. But as we now break for this foot washing, I want to pray with you. Lord God, I thank you for these reminders that you, you offer living water. And that your blood washes us clean of the sin in our lives. That you are the bread of life, that you sustain us here in our lives. Lord, I pray that you'd come into our hearts in a more deep and intimate way as we do this devotional experience together. We love you. Looking forward to seeing you. Amen. This time we'll separate. We've got three rooms down at the end of the hall. We've got uh, a women's room. We've got a men's room. And we've got one for families straight at the end in the fellowship hall. We'll meet back here right after that. Don't forget to pick up your little emblems in the prepackaged form as you come back. See you in a little bit.
surrender all. We're going to sing this to the tune of Shall We Gather at the River. So it's a very joyous, happy song.
chance to get the emblems, the wafer and the juice. Does anybody need one still? We have at least one. So just, if you need emblems, just go ahead and raise your hand and the deacons will bring some to you. And yes, make sure the band has some as well. Thank you. So I think Brian back here, you can go ahead and raise your hand there. You're good? Brian's good. All right. Just want to make sure everybody has what they need. Buzz and Harry over here as well. Thank you, gentlemen. Now that we've regathered, it is time for us to shift our focus to the symbols of Christ's body and his blood that was broken for us. One of our members, Brother Rod Zuver, who at one point was our head elder here, one of the things that I've been blessed by when he prays is that the blood of Jesus would wash us clean. I don't know if when you pray with Rod or if you've heard him pray, you've heard him say that. And it's true, the blood of Jesus washes us clean when we claim by faith that sacrifice. And today, that's what we're doing. This is a devotional exercise. There's there's nothing magical or there's no power in these elements themselves, but the faith by which we approach this devotional exercise actually is effective in our hearts and in our minds. And so now, as as we bow our heads, we want to invite the Holy Spirit to be with us as we partake of these emblems. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for sending Jesus, that he was willing to come and be with us. I ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to guide us and direct us in this service. Jesus, thank you for your gift of giving your life for us, that we can live eternally with you. Thank you for your body that was broken, the symbol that we have in front of us that we're holding. You've given it to us. And we can take that in, and our lives can be changed. Lord, help us to just keep you in and close to us. Please bless this time, bless this bread, and may we fully take you in that we can... Go and share your love with others. You have given so much, and I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And Father, as we continue to come to you, we 
Thank you for Jesus who shed his blood for us. That was such a horrible experience, but he was willing to do it because he loves each one of us. Oh, thank you for that wonderful gift of the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all sin. And as we drink the juice today, help us to remember always it was a gift of love because he wants us. We just give ourselves to you again today. Take us, cleanse us with the blood of Jesus. Bless us, draw us close to you. Help us always to remember how much you love us. Thank you for your gift. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. In the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul recounts the Last Supper. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he says, For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Paul continues, in the same way he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Would you pray with me as the team comes forward for one final closing song? Lord God, thank you, Jesus, for coming to this world, for taking our guilt and our sin on yourself, for dying the death that we deserve so that we could have the life that you deserve. Lord, I pray that you would truly and genuinely come into our hearts and into our minds, into our lives, that we would, that we would be filled with the presence of the Spirit that we would be the temple of the Holy Spirit and that Jesus would live in us through the Spirit's presence. We thank you for this symbolic devotional time. I pray that we would be changed and never the same because of it. And we love you. Amen. Why don't we stand? Power in the blood.
their passion and pride. There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for the queen's into Calvary's time. There's wonderful power in the blood. There's this power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the land. janitor because everything just dropped is is hard to pick up thank you so much and there is power in the blood that's the wonderful thing that god has done for us let's bow our heads loving father thank you thank you for that power that you give us that we can freely accept go with us now as we go home Guide us, keep us close to you. Be with each person as they go out into the world again. Bless them. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Go with God's grace.